All right, I think we're going to get underway. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Marquette University Law School in Eckstein Hall. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people who are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Uh, today we are joined by a gentleman, well, I'll describe him in a couple of ways. Uh, one is uh, he's a music icon. I don't think that's too strong a term to use here. It's not hyperbole. It's, it's the truth. And the other way I would describe him is he is, in, in some respects, an urban pioneer. So uh, won't you please give a warm welcome to the chairman and founder of Philadelphia International Records and Universal Companies, <laughs> Kenneth Gamble. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to have you here. Thank you. I'm, I'm, it's my pleasure being here. Uh, he is here from uh, his hometown of Philadelphia. And before we get too far, I have to reach into my pocket. And those of you who come to these events know I don't do this very often where I actually look at some notes. But I wanted to make sure I got all of this right. <laughs> so I'm sitting next to uh, a gentleman who wrote, produced, recorded, published more than 3,000 songs. Uh, these are songs that were performed by artists like the Jackson Five, Teddy Pendergrass, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, the Spinners, the OJs, Jerry Butler, Dionne Warwick, Lou Rawls. <laughs> yeah. Songs that I said earlier, I said to him, I said, this is sort of the soundtrack of my life, personally, so from a selfish standpoint. But I mean, me and Mrs. Jones, um, I, I mean, that was a good one, right? <laughs> Me and Mrs. Jones. The Backstabbers. Uh, <laughs> Love Train. Um, the Sound of Philadelphia Soul Train theme. Uh, I, I mean, it's amazing. And he's also been inducted into just about every Hall of Fame there is. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame. I could go on and on. But suffice to say, um, you've had a lot of success in the music business. And, and I want to begin by asking you the question that I know anybody who's had that kind of success finds difficult, and that is, what are you most proudest? What, 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 what are you most proud of in your in your career, your music career? Well, I think the thing that I'm most proud of is um, is how uh, my partner and I, uh, Leon Huff, <clears throat> how we've been able to work together for the last 50 years, you know. And um, we continue to work together, you know, and um, and how we were able to open doors for other young writers, you know, like McFadden and Whitehead. You've heard of them guys before. Mm -hmm. uh, Ain't no stopping us now. You ever heard that song? Before? <laughs> <clears throat> that was a good one. Yeah, <laughs> and. Um, and not only them, but uh, Tom Bell, Linda Creed, they did all the stylistic songs like uh, uh, Betcha by Golly Wow and Stone in Love. I mean, these are, these are fantastic songs. And, uh, and so many, there's so many writers and young people that, that never would have had an opportunity because it was not easy for, for myself and Huff to get an opportunity, always doors being slammed in our faces, you know, but you... You got to keep. Um, you got to be persistent, and uh, I think, I think that's the thing I'm most proud of is that we were able to build a refuge or a safe house for young people who had extreme talent, because it wasn't just Gamble and Huff, you know. Although we were probably the role model for them, and uh, but there were so many young musicians and arrangers, pe people who couldn't read music learned how to write music and to be um, be uh, directors of orchestras and stuff. So, so mm -hmm. I think that's the thing that I'm most proud of, giving opportunities to myself and to others. I'm going to kind of make this a, a two-part conversation, and we'll spend the first few minutes on, on um, Kenny Gamble's uh, extraordinary musical career. But the second part will be on the work he's doing today in neighborhoods and in schools. And... Uh, but, but let me ask you, as a, a young kid growing up in South Philly, mm -hmm. uh, how, how did you know that music was going to be your career? What, uh, give us some insight into... Well, well growing up in South Philly, uh, I, well, first of all, I didn't know that I wanted it to be. I loved music, you know. 
But uh, I think that the thing that inspired me most was, um, you know, when me and my brothers and all the young guys from the neighborhood, we would stand on the corners in the summertime and we would sing on the corners. We would go down to the subway where there was an echo in the subway. And, and everybody wanted to be like Frankie Lyman or wanted to be like um, Little Anthony and the Imperials. You know, so that was the music of that day that inspired us. Um, you're talking about the late 50s and 60s, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, You had your own group, didn't you? The, the Romeos? Oh, yeah, we had the Romeos. Kenny Gamble. Well, I, had, I had a couple of groups before the Romeos. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had groups all my whole life, see, like, and um, well, my brother Charles and my brother Carl and my cousin Earl, we, that was my first group. And uh, I used to write songs for them. And as a matter of fact, uh, my first song I wrote for, um, for our group was called A Tender Kiss. Never recorded it, but it's still in my head, you know. Mm -hmm. so, and, um, and so I always like to write music. But, but the one thing that uh, when, when you say that inspired me was, I can remember <clears throat> there was a time where in South Philly, that we, everybody didn't have a television. You know, so it was uh, uh, Billy Clark and Bobby Clark who lived up the street from us, and they had a television. They had one of those televisions that you had to put a quarter in it. You put a quarter in it, and, and then you could see a certain show. Yep. So we used to go over to Billy and Bobby Clark's house, and uh, the Glenn Miller story came on one night. And when I saw the Glenn Miller story, I told my mother, I said, you know, I'm going to have a band like that one day. My mother said, you ain't going to have no band. Said, you better go to school, you know. And, um, and, and even till today, when the Glenn Miller story comes on television, I really, you know, I want to see it because it was such a great story about guys who were really musicians trying to make it. And um, they finally made it big. And uh, he had a lovely wife. Uh, I can't remember her name, but you know, he was able to juggle between the music and uh, and his family life. And and so today, I look back on that, and we did have an orchestra. We had an or orchestra called MFSB, which was mother, father, sister, brother. Some people thought it meant something else. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, you know, you got you got to play you got to play tricks with words sometimes to get people's uh, attention. So. Um, and that, that was the orchestra that played, uh, that was previously the Romeos. Mm -hmm. The Romeos was, was a band where um, Huff and myself and Tom Bell and Roland Chambers and Roland's brother Carl Chambers and uh, a guy named Winnie Wolford, we all were young musicians together. Mm -hmm. And in order to make a little additional money on the weekends, we used to perform at local clubs. And um, that grew into uh, into an orchestra. They they became the house band for our recording studio. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> so that's a long answer to your no, question, by the way. Right. <laughs> but but that's 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 what really inspired me is is the the environment that I grew up in, and uh, and I guess the entertainment that we provided for our neighborhood with us standing on the corners and singing, whatever. I mean, it might be the whole neighborhood would come and listen to us singing, you know, so. I want to ask you good. about the, the songwriting aspect of this. You, you touched on that a moment ago, uh, you and, and, and Leon Huff. And, and, you know, you'll hear songwriters, people in the music business, some of them will talk about what a challenging, laborious process it is. They, they you know, work for hours, days, weeks. How was it for the two of you? Oh, it was fun. Fun. It, it was magic. I mean, uh, <clears throat> when I met uh, Huff, um, we were working in the same building. We were both trying to, to make it in the music industry. And there was a building in Philadelphia called the Schubert Building. And it was sort of like the Brill Building in New York where publishers and record companies of that sort used to... Uh, they, they basically were in this building. So I used to hang around down there, and I worked with a guy named, his name was Jerry Ross, who, uh, who was like a blessing in disguise for me because I used to wait downstairs every day, you know, for somebody to come in and ask him, say, I said, do you make records? Do you need a song? You know, and, 
And all of a sudden, then Jerry Ross tells me, he said, well, come on upstairs one day. So I went up to his office and started showing him my songs. And uh, he said, you know, I like, I like what you're doing. And, uh, and one day, I get on the elevator coming into um, to the Schubert building, and Huff is on the elevator. And he's working on the second floor. I was on the sixth floor. He was on the second floor. So we struck up a conversation. And um, that weekend, Huff and I uh, decided, well, let's get together. Let's try to write some songs together, you know. And believe me, it was like magic because he was um, a keyboard player and I was a lyricist. So it made it very easy, you know, because before I'm playing the guitar and I barely can play the guitar myself. And it's easier if you have a partner that you're working with that specializes in something that you're not as good doing. So Huff was an excellent keyboard player, and it was like one person. Huff and I was like one person because if if he would use one chord, I would be able to. And plus, I can I, I basically um, I can sing a little bit, you know, mm. not real good, but just a little bit, you know, <laughs> good enough to get the point across, you know. <laughs> and so um, and so so. It was easy for us because it was fun. It's what we wanted to do, you know, writing songs. And uh, and as I told you upstairs, I said, our, our songwriting sessions <clears throat> would begin with a conversation. And uh, Huff and I were, were good friends, number one. That, that's beyond everything. We're good friends. And we're also good business partners and we write songs together. But we would sit and talk. Like a song like Love Train, you know. How many, is it, anybody heard the Love Train in there? <laughs> I'm, just make, I'm just making sure. I want to know who I'm talking to. All right, but anyway, um, like a song like Love Train, for an example, um, Huff and I were sitting there one day, and we were looking at TV, and we were talking about how the world is so divided and how people can't get along with each other, you know, and that just, just and, and it's even, I mean, this is a song that will last probably forever because the world is, is even worse now than it was back then. And that's like 1973 or something like that, 74, Love Train. So that's like, what, about 35 years ago? 40, almost 40 years ago. Yeah. Showed you how old I'm getting. <laughs> but the point is that um, once you, you start talking about that and then... Uh, then we said, well, what is, the, world, the world needs a love train or something. A train needs to go around the world and pick up people that want peace or something like that. And then we just jumped on the piano, and the inspiration comes from, from I guess, comes from heaven above, that, that you, you get the inspiration, and you really cannot control it. You don't know what it is, but it just, it's like you are like a, a vehicle for that inspiration. And in order to make sure that we don't lose it, we had a tape recorder up there so that we would record everything that we were doing. Because afterwards, you barely can even remember it. And if we didn't tape record it, I mean, it would just be between Huff and myself. So we would be record it, and then, then we, would, we would be able to teach it to ourselves from the tape recorder because it was all inspiration. It was nothing that was planned uh, off straight from the head. I want to talk to you uh, in just a moment about uh, some of the messages in the music and, mm -hmm. and ultimately what that led you to in the next phase of your life. But I did want to ask you about starting your own record company, Philadelphia International, 1971. Right. Uh, people thought of uh, Motown in Detroit in the 60s. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, it was Philadelphia International and the Philly Sound. Um, why did you feel the need for your own record company? Well, I felt the need that um, that we had to start our own record company because there were not a lot of opportunities for us. And, you know, when, you, when you're really trying to make it in the music industry, you know, there's not many places for us to go. And, uh, and so Huff and I, we, we decided that, hey, look, let's start our own record company. Since people don't believe in us, you know, we, you know, we believe in ourselves. 
And so, um, and it really turned out to be the best thing that we could do because um, we, had, um, we had a partner in the beginning. His name was uh, Benny Crass. He was a guy who owned a, a clothing store, but he liked to sing himself. <clears throat> and so one day I'm in his clothing store. We were getting some, some uniforms for our group, the Romeos, and he said, he said, Kenny, uh, I, I need you to make a record for me. I said, okay. He said, I got some songs, so he wanted me to, to record him. And uh, so he sounded pretty good, you know. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, well, why don't you be my partner? I said, let's start a record company. You know, we got a couple of artists that we work with. Because he wanted to pay us <clears throat> for working with him. I said, no, I don't want to get paid. Just invest in the company. So he gave us about $700. And we had a, a young group from Camden called the Swans, three girls. And Huff and I, we wrote a song for them. And it sounded good. The song sounded real good. But that wasn't really the song that, that I thought that we should have put um, out as our first record. So we got, uh, we sold the master. And selling the master is like if, if you're a creative person, you can go in the studio and record something and then sell it to a major company. So we sold it to, uh, there was a disc jockey friend of ours, Jimmy Bishop, who, um, who helped us get to the president of, um, of Bell Sound, Bell Records. Bell Records, he, they gave us $3,500 for, uh, for that master. So I went back to Benny. I said, Benny, here's your 700 back. He said, no. I said, we got 3500 I said, here's your 700 He said, no, I want to keep it in. I want to keep that 700 in. He said, so do another record. So we had a group called The Intruders. And Huff and I started recording The Intruders. And uh, we had uh, a couple of good regional records in with The Intruders. And distribution at that particular time was basically uh, was local distribution. Like in Philadelphia, they had maybe like 12, 13 distributors in Philadelphia. In New York, they had maybe 40 distributors. So an independent company like, uh, um, like we had in those days, they don't exist today. You don't have independent distributors like you did in those days. So, um, so when we got the intruders, and, and eventually what happened is that we got a big hit with the intruders. It was called Cowboys to Girls. You ever heard of Cowboys to Girls? Oh, okay. I'm just, I'm just checking with you. I just, want to, I just want to make sure y'all know what's going on. And we got Cowboys to Girls, and, uh, um, and it, it became such a big hit. And, um, and that was the beginning. And then Benny, the funny part about Benny was, Benny Crass, was he was in the clothing business, and he was smart. And, um, and we had put, a, we had put a, a good group together for this, uh, the name of the label was Gamble Records, and what inspired us was uh, Motown. Motown was, I mean, that was the blueprint for us, you know. And um, and so Jerry Butler, we started recording Jerry Butler. Huff and I did a, a record with him called Lost, and then we did um, Only the Strong Survive with Jerry Butler. Y'all remember that one? <laughs> okay. Now, and, and the funny thing about that song was is that Elvis Presley recorded Only the Strong Survive maybe a few years later. So that was, that was really a plus for us. Talking about the king of rock and roll, right? So, um, so Jerry Butler's contract was, um, was uh, available. He was coming out of his contract. We recorded him for Mercury Records. And um, so I went to Benny. I said, Benny, I said, I think we can get Jerry Butler, you know, for our label. And... Um, Benny said, well, how much is it going to cost? I said, well, probably about $35,000. He said, that's it for me. I'm out. <laughs> he said, I'm in the clothing business. But we, but we continued on to be friends with Benny was a uh, great friend. Uh, but Jerry Butler, we continued to record him for Mercury Records. And, um, and then Benny got out of uh, the business, and that's when we started Philly International. And the industry changed. All of those independent distributors, the major companies bought them all up. So there wasn't independent distribution anymore. And so the major companies like CBS, RCA, Warner Brothers, and all these, they bought up all of the independents. So that a young guy like myself 
uh, the best move for us was that we made a deal with CBS for distribution. Dis distribution and marketing and all that kind of stuff. And, and it was good and bad. Um, um, the good part was is that we were able to put records out and not only just break them records. When I say break, I mean expose them and market them on a regional basis. This was international. It, when, when they put our records out, it was not just in New York, Baltimore, Washington, and Philadelphia. It was all over the world. And so it was, we sold more, we had more volume. The bad part of it was is that we were in business with somebody who was competing with us, you know. And so that wasn't too good because they, listen, you know CBS, CBS got, got resources that, that you couldn't even imagine. So let me fast forward a few years. Mm -hmm. This, this, uh, um, record company becomes very successful, you become very successful. Um, you do what a lot of people do, you move out to the suburbs of Philadelphia yeah. uh, and leave South <laughs> Philly behind. Uh, but at some point you didn't find that terribly fulfilling. You, you sort of had an epiphany of sorts. It, it was like, that's not where I belong. Tell us about that. That's a good word, epiphany. <laughs> yeah, because that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, traveling all over the country, promoting um, our music. You know, I used to go all the state. I used to come to Milwaukee here all the time. There was a disc jockey here named O.C. White, who was a real good friend of mine. <laughs> Y'all know O.C., right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was my real good friend, you know, and uh, he used to play all of our music, and uh, and we had a good relationship with him. And uh, and then there was uh, the Miller's company, uh, Jim Thompson, used to support all of the things that we were doing. And, uh, and uh, we had an organization called the Black Music Association. So it, it became came obvious to me that, um, that the devastation in the African-American community was not just in Philadelphia. It was all over the country all over the country that that the African American community was pretty much out of position to really benefit from all of the things that were available to us. And so um, after writing songs like um, like For the Love of Money, you know, uh, and um, Wake Up Love Everybody, Train, wake, up, wake Up Everybody, and uh, and all, the, all of these songs were, were mine. They stimulate your mind. They stimulate your mind. And, uh, and they, also, um, they also help you to, to see what, I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, after you've been blessed with all, all of these inspirations, whatever. So, so I decided to, uh, to move, me and my wife and my, ch my children were getting older. And um, 1978, we started buying a lot of properties in my old neighborhood in South Philadelphia. And boy, I was just buying prop. There was only like a couple thousand dollars at that particular time, and uh, we had accumulated uh, over a hundred and about 125 properties in this particular neighborhood. This neighborhood was devastated. This is where I grew up at, uh, which when I grew up it was it was beautiful. I mean, we were singing on the corners, and we had we had a ball growing up, and didn't know anything about poverty in the sense of poverty's sake. So um, we, were, um, we were buying properties like left and right, and then one day you sit up and you say, hey, what are we gonna do with all these properties? <laughs> uh, and I laugh because the funny part about it, you got properties that they're not bringing any income in, but you still gotta pay the taxes on them, you know? I said, we, I said, we done got ourselves into a mess. You know, but but the desire, the desire to help the community was that was stronger than anything else. It was stronger than anything else we could think of. So a few years went by. So 19, uh, 1990, we decided to move back into the neighborhood. And we sold our house in Gladwin. This was a beautiful area. It still is a beautiful area. My theory was this. Well, we'll try it and see what happens. Let's see if we can, we can make a difference, you know? 
I said, because Gladwin will always be here, is what I said you know, to my wife and my children. I said, it'll always be here, and there'll always be another house that'll be for sale or whatever, and if, if we wanted to come back, maybe. But once we got to South Philly, and that morning, that next morning that we woke up today, it was like a cultural sh shock for my children and my wife because this neighborhood was devastated. It was unbelievable. Drugs, crack houses, prostitutes, everything you can think of. So you had to figure out, so the we, first thing I, I thought of, I said, well, I'm going to put security in this neighborhood. So I called up a few brothers and we had security, 24-hour security. Sit down and talk to many of the young brothers that was on the corners drinking beer and shooting dice and all that kind of stuff. You can't do that around here no more. If you want to do that, do it in your house. You can't do it. Not anymore. And they were cooperative because they had children too. And it's not like we're trying to tell them what to do. We're just trying to put some type of, uh, of discipline in the community. And then you know, fast forward a little bit. Um, we'd always thought about education. And um, then about two years later, after I moved down there, uh, uh, Brother Raheem was over here. Give him a big hand. Stand up, Raheem, so they can see you, man. <laughs> this guy, he's all working. Uh, so so Raheem, he, he calls me up. He comes down to see me. And he says, um, you know, I'm giving a dinner and I want you to be on the committee. I said, okay. So I said, well, you gotta get everybody to be on the committee. You know, get, get the whole community on the committee. And, um, and then we started to talk about, you know, he said, well, what are you doing down here? I mean, what's going on and everything? So I, I had things on little pieces of paper and different ideas and things that I write down, you know, because as a songwriter, you know, I, what I did was write titles down all the time. I could be, at any time, I could have 10 pieces of little scrap paper in my pocket with different titles on it or whatever. And so I did the same thing with this, basically to come up with a concept of how to rebuild a community. So Raheem said, well, he said, well, let me have all that, all that stuff you got there and let me put it all together, you know? And uh, so, we did the dinner. The dinner became a big success, but we can we continued to talk. And he said, you know, I want to do the same thing that you're doing. I want to help rebuild our communities. So um, the rest is history. We, we got together. Raheem moved down to South Philly. I gave him one of them raggedy houses that I had. <laughs> you know, and uh, he had his sons with him and his wife and then the the next thing you know, here was Shahid and here was John. I mean, it just, it was like a magnet. It was like a magnet. And then the newspapers, they, they put an article in the paper uh, about me saying, uh, you know, what's Kenny Gamble trying to do down in South Philly, you know? And, and basically, I had gone to all the schools in that, in that area. I had gone to Stanton uh, Elementary School. That was my elementary school, which is a block away from where we were living. I went to Barrett Junior High School, and uh, so I was familiar with the neighborhood. And um, when we started a small construction company, we started fixing up some of the buildings. And uh, fortunately for us, um, we um, we were right in time. We were thinking about uh, we, we were thinking about education as being the number one priority because you cannot do anything without education. And we looked at the African-American uh, situation. We said, okay, so why is the African-American community in the shape that it's in? So we figured it out. We figured out that this country, the United States of America, which is, is a great country, and, and the laws of this country, the foundation of this country is is great. The Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and the Bill of Rights. You, you need those laws because that was the platform that helped our ancestors who were denied the right to an education from a legal standpoint. The, the, the country 
it was a law against people of African descent to learn to read or write. And if any of you ever saw that movie, 12 Years a Slave, then you would see that one of the things that they told uh, the guy who was a slave, he said, do not let these people know that you can read or write. So you start from there and you say, okay, so our ancestors were able to figure it out with those documents that I just uh, mentioned to you on how we could get to where we are today. So what else is wrong with the African American community? This legacy of slavery, this disruption of the African American families of distrust and separating children from their mothers and fathers. People don't like to talk about this a lot, but, but this is real. This is a real thing, and I'm interested in the, the bottom line of everything is we've got to save America. There is no other place to go but America. You, you, want, you want to be able to save America, but America is going to have to be able to save itself. And one of the things it's got to do is to realize what has happened, what's going on now, and where are we going in the future. And so when you look at it today, you look at all the young African Americans that are in prison and, and the destabilizing of, of education where kids don't even know if they're going to be going to school um, next fall. They don't know if there's going to be enough funding for it. it and basically, this is in African American schools. So, to make a long, long story short, um, that's what we decided to do. We, we decided to, uh, to spend, um, spend this wonderful thing that we call life, uh, spend it helping others, uplifting the African-American community. Because when you think about it, <clears throat> you're born into this world. And nobody really told, told us to be so determined as a sperm. All of us, everybody in this room here was the most determined sperm. <laughs> but am I right? Yes. All right. Okay. This is how I see stuff, okay? And, um, and so you got to the egg. And you went through that process. And you, no one can get in this world unless you come in through the womb of a woman. And so you sisters, I applaud you. Let me give you a big hand. I applaud you because um, there wouldn't even be a humanity without a female. And so once you get into this world, you come into this dimension you know, you, you inhale, you take that breath of life, right? And then, I guess you have to say, we all, we've all been through this process, we're still going through it now. I guess you gotta figure out, well, well what's next? <clears throat> Why is there life? Why, what are we doing here in the first place? So, these are the things that I used to ask myself. And I figured out that what we're here to do is to, uh, to help advance humanity and to take care of this wonderful uh, concept called life because it's only for a moment. Life is only for a moment and then, then you go to another dimension and I don't know how many dimensions it is but you're only going to be here for a little while. So, so that's a long answer to your question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but the bottom line of it is what are you going to do with your life? So I figured out, hey listen, we're, we're going we're gonna, to uh, work as hard as we can to help solve the problem in the African-American community because it is unbelievable what's going on in the African-American community. So to give you some perspective, uh, I was looking at some of the information about Universal Companies, which is uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Gamble's uh, uh, company. But, I mean, he mentioned, uh, I think you've been a conduit for $1.5 billion in real estate investment. Yes. Um, we talked about properties that have been refurbished where people are now living, um, schools. Uh, 
Philadelphia was always the, the epicenter for all of his activity for you, mm -hmm. but now you've come to Milwaukee uh, about a year ago. You opened up the uh, uh, Universal Academy for yeah. the college bound, college bound, two campuses. Yes. Um, why Milwaukee? Why, why would you bring what you have done in Philadelphia to this city? Well, Milwaukee is, um, well, it started in, uh, a few years back when there was an article in the Black Enterprise uh, about what we were doing in Philadelphia. And an old friend of mine who I mentioned earlier, his name is Jim Thompson, he called me up and he said, Kenny, he said, I see what you're doing. You guys are doing a great job. He said, why wouldn't you, can you come to Milwaukee and help us, you know? And so I said, okay. So I told Raheem and, um, about Jim Thompson and uh, and the kind of relationship that I'd had with him, you know, all those years. And so Raheem came up and met with them and started meeting all of the people here in, in Milwaukee. And um, and that's pretty much how it started. And and we found, and, and believe it or not, I mean, Milwaukee, Chicago, uh, Detroit, Philadelphia, it's all the same. It's all the same when it comes to the African-American community. There is, there is a need for for all America to concentrate on this particular issue. This issue is not going to go away. It's going to get worse unless there is some some type of united force to work. Because in, in Philadelphia, when you when you mentioned it, the real estate it's it's economics. It's business. It's all business because. In Philadelphia, the, the, the property values in Philadelphia, in that neighborhood, when I'm telling you that they used to, like $1,000, $2,000, 5000 then 10 then 20 then 30 you couldn't buy a lot in that same neighborhood today for over $250,000. So it's about economics. You have people who uh, are moving into those neighborhoods. You have, um, you have a revitalized neighborhood. Um, we've done... Uh, so many projects where they're mixed income projects, number one, and you wouldn't be able to tell a house that costs five hundred thousand dollars from from one from the cost a hundred thousand dollars so um, so you so we we have a plan we have a plan and and we're meeting with all the people here in milwaukee we're, we're getting a lot of friends here i mean I mean I like Milwaukee Milwaukee is treating us better than Philadelphia, I would think. <laughs> You, know. you said, uh, yeah, it's interesting, mm -hmm. you said to me you see potential. I see a lot Milwaukee. of potential in Milwaukee. I like Milwaukee. I just got to get some, some more uh, corduroys for the wintertime. <laughs> you know, because it's cold up here. And, uh, but, uh, but, but it's beautiful. It really is a beautiful city. And uh, it reminds me of, of Chicago. It's like a little Chicago with the lake. And uh, it's not... It's not there's not many, uh, I think the land, the, the way it's where it's set up, even the houses, um, it's not like Philadelphia. Philadelphia have row houses in Philadelphia. Here you at least got some space between the houses. And, uh, and I, I think that, that one of the things that, that we try to do, and it's not going to be overnight. This, is, this didn't happen overnight, so it's not going to end overnight. Is, this is going to be a constant maintenance of human behavior. You, you must be able to deal with human behavior. And so um, the African-American community here in uh, Milwaukee, I've been riding through the community, and uh, Raheem and I, we've been going to different places, and, and you, need, you need jobs. You need jobs. You need, you need a new spirit, a new spirit of... Uh, of pride and uh, need entrepreneurs, you need businesses, and and that starts first with um, that starts first with a plan. You have to come up with a plan. I want to ask you this this question. Uh, you mentioned that you know as a nation we need to come to to grips with the uh, mm -hmm. realities in some of our cities. Yep. Um, is this a problem solved by government? Is it a problem solved through Self-help is it all of the above? How how would you? Look I think at that? it's I think it's all of the above. 
I think government can only do but so much, you know. And uh, the will of the people. Uh, we wrote a song a long time ago for Billy Paul. It's not it wasn't a big hit, but it was called People Power. And it's it's unbelievable what people can do when they put their minds to it. And um, but the economics, the the, the banks, the uh, um, the the government, the, the community, the churches, and all these different things. It's got to be business. It can't be emotional. It can't be an emotional thing. It has to be built on economics. And once you build something on economics, then it's sort of like it's able to stand on its own two feet. And, um, and you have principles. You have principles that you live by. So um, we've been meeting with uh, just about everybody up here, and um, I find that we got some wonderful people here in Milwaukee. And I mean, in Philadelphia, when, when you speak of politics, for an example, we've, um, we've come up with something, and when it, we call it the universal plan, what we're doing. And we look at the, um, the community as if it was a body, a human body. The community has different systems that it works with, education system, economic system, the uh, political, all these different systems that they work with. And the body has systems, you know, you've got your muscular systems, your skeletal system, you've got all these things. If one of those systems in your body is messed up, then all the rest of them are out of whack too, you see. Same thing happens in a community. It's a body. When the education is messed up, then the political starts to hurt, everything gets off balance. So the community's off balance. And so at one point in time, they thought that, um, that by having a black mayor, having a black police chief, a black fire chief, a black district attorney, a black superintendent of the schools, and so forth, basically that was, okay, well, let's see what happens with that. In Philadelphia, you've had three black mayors and they've been there eight years apiece. That's 24 years. 24 years is a long time. But have, have we made progress? Yes, some progress. But you still have the problem in the African-American communities. I think the nation has tried. And it just hasn't been African-American people to vote in those people. It's been all people have been trying. But are we trying the wrong thing? Because evidently, that did not solve the problem. The problem has gotten worse because it's violence. The violence that, that's, uh, that's, that exists today is uncomfortable. Life is too precious, too precious to be dealing with fear. When people, are, when people see an African-American uh, walking down the street, the first thing that comes to their mind is the images that they, they come into their mind. They fear. It's fear. It's been happening. To, it happens to me. So I go out of my, out of my way. So I say, well, how are you doing today? You okay? You know what I mean? Because you want to put people at ease. Let them know that I'm not some a maniac or something. Because on television and in the newspapers and in the movies, the media basically portrays African people as somebody that is out of control and it's been that way since the beginning so and then also to the uh, um, the the pictures that's painted of Africa Africa is considered to be uh, a place that's a jungle they had Tarzan who, who could uh, who could control all of the uh, the animals one man that can control all the animals in, in the jungle so when the Africans, he could beat all of the kings of all these great tribes and everything. So there, there's a lot of misconceptions, a lot of myths that, that have been created that need to be corrected. That's why it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a long time because these myths are really embedded into our environment. And they affect the African-American community. It's like Raheem says, if, if the rest of America catches a cold, the African-American community catches pneumonia 
from all of these things. And so, you know, it's, it's going to take time. It's going to take time, but I think that we have time because the new young people, the younger people that are coming, you have to let them know what the plan is. And the plan is to uplift all people. It's one world and it's one people. There is no other way. We all go the same way. We all are born, we live, and we die. We all have to eat. We all have to drink water. We all, and so once that message is put out into to the atmosphere where people can understand that we are all the same and that we all have the same destiny, then you'll be able to see us being able to deal with all of the other things that are coming upon uh, you know, coming upon this, this planet that we're living on. I mean, we could go on all day. You know, my mind is, is moving right at this moment. Let me ask one final question. We'll take a couple questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, what would you like to see uh, as a role for Universal in Milwaukee? You've got a couple of campuses now. Yeah. What else do you want to do here? Well, I think, I think we're pretty much on target, but I, I would like to get um, more schools. And in Philadelphia, it took us almost 15 years to be able to get, uh, in the last two years, we were able to get a high school. So we have a pre-K program all the way up to 12th grade. Yeah. We would like to have the same thing here so that we could bring a young person in, in uh, pre-kindergarten, take them all the way through, and also work with the universities so we can have more opportunities for young African Americans to go on to college. And, <laughs> and uh, create the academies. Like in Philadelphia, we like to do the same thing we're doing in Philadelphia. We have, um, we, we work at our high school, we have uh, an arrangement with uh, SEPTA. SEPTA is a transportation company in, uh, in Philadelphia, southeastern Pennsylvania. And so SEPTA, the deal we have with SEPTA is that they have bought some of their buses to the school and they're training the young men and women how to, um, how to fix these buses because SEPTA has, uh, I mean, they, they always need, need new people, so they're training them, so maybe they don't want to go to college, but they'll have a, they'll have a, a skill when they come out of school. And um, we're working with the health care, and, and so I'd like to see, see Milwaukee be a, a duplicate of what we're doing in Philadelphia, where we have an effect on the community, the community's consciousness, so that they can um, they can consider that education is the number one priority, number one, and stop taking things out of education. I mean, you got schools, they don't have any music, they don't have no dance, they don't have no arts, they don't have any sports, they don't have all it. It's no, it doesn't make sense. You have that in your. In your schools, exactly, and and I'll tell you something. We're and we're even doing more uh, uh, now. The economics of the whole thing is uh, that's the question: is being able to find the dollars uh, to be able to um, to maintain all of these programs because the school districts and whatever they, I think I think that uh, they are they are in a lot of trouble many of them because of the um, to tax base because basically education is, is from a, from a tax base uh, mm -hmm. so but so far we've been doing pretty good and one thing I always say is that um, you know the school district is always in a deficit and at Universal we're never in a deficit so we're doing something right we're we're able to uh, to manage and produce um, quality environment, safe environment, and, and, and I really do, I ask many of the parents, I say, well, why do you send your kids to Universal? And the first thing the parents say to me is because it's safe. It's safe, and, and that's number one. It's just like when we went to South Philly and I put security in that neighborhood, that's the same thing with Universal Schools, security. Because we know the nature of, of, of what we're dealing with. You also have, and I'm sorry, I'm Go taking ahead. away the time from the audience here. Okay. I can't help myself. I have mm. a lot of questions. Mm -mm. Um, but you have more African-American teachers, more African-American administrators, do you not, in your schools? Oh. Is that not something that you 
give thought to? Yes. Well, we, we have, but we have um, teachers, we have Caucasian teachers, uh, African-American. Everybody's the same. It, there is no difference. I mean, if somebody that you know uh, that doesn't have blood running through their veins, then they're different. But as long as you got blood running through your veins, you are a human being and you have the same problems that everybody else has. And once we come to that recognition, then you can get someplace. The, the question becomes, uh, you do need more African-American teachers because you need to, to encourage people to be teachers, you know, both male and male teachers in, in particular uh, would be fine. But um, I think that, that the, the number one thing that has to happen now is what kind of education are you given? And what we're on the verge of doing and what we're doing is teaching young African-Americans, where did you come from? Who are you? Who are your ancestors? Hey, that's good. It's part of the curriculum, is it not? This is part of our curriculum. Mm. Because, because, you know, when you start to think about it, you know, uh, where, where did, we're not slaves. We're not descendants of slaves. Our ancestors were captured people. They, we're prisoners of war. And so when you look at the African American in this country, you got to realize that we're not no descendants of any slaves. Our ancestors were, were uh, kings and queens in Africa. And so this is the message, our universal message, is that we're, we're not slaves or, or inferior, inferior, because this whole society has been dealing with, with someone being superior and someone being inferior. That's not the way it is. It doesn't go like that because... You know, um, there, there are many people who proclaim uh, different things about their superiority, but you cannot be superior if you live and you died. And what are you superior at doing? You, you, what are you doing different than anybody else? Do you get hungry? Yes, I get hungry. So what makes you superior then if, uh, if you get hungry? Do you have to go to the bathroom so if that answer is yes, then we're all the same. Let me take a couple of questions from the audience Go members. <laughs> Let me, uh, I'll start here and uh, we'll go around the room real quickly. Yeah, and press down on that rim there. Yeah, there you go. How do you measure success at the universal schools? Are you looking at an outcome of a lifelong learner? Are you using st standardized testing as your measure? What would you say is most important? I didn't hear it. How do you measure success at your schools? Are you using um, standardized testing? Are you using other measurements? How do you determine Well, I think success? we do it all. I think we do it all. Whatever, there's certain requirements that uh, charter schools have to, have to um, like in Philadelphia and, and here in Milwaukee, they have standardized tests and everything. But I think it's too soon to know what our success will be. Our success, in, in my view, we have teachers uh, who are very qualified teachers. and But what makes Universal different is that it's not just, it's just, not just uh, um, education as, as, as usual. They don't teach in, in, in many of the schools what we are bringing to the schools. We're, we're a little bit different. We're teaching uh, our students how to be how to be community people. In other words, how, 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 do you, how do you get your education and stay in the community? How do you get your education and develop yourself so that you don't run out of the community and leave the African-American community? Because what happens to most African-Americans, I mean, truth be told, is that basically I did it myself, you know, when I moved to Gladwin, you know, you're trying to get away from the issue. You got to stay in your own community and help your own community. So um, I think uh, many of the questions, uh, uh, the type of question you asked, if um, you come to Universal, you'll see that we have some some wonderful people there that take care of the the uh, the educational aspect. But I'm basically in, involved from the business aspect of of education. 
because education is a business also too, and many people uh, have been profiting from uh, education. I'm not in interested in, and uh, uh, I'm not interested in in, in, uh, uh, in those persons who want to hold on to education. It's been a cash cow for people for years, and and for so many years, and so the opportunity presents itself for people like myself and Raheem and um, Universal is a nonprofit organization. We have quite a few people working with us, but if, if we turn out, I always tell everybody at our, our company, I say, if we can't do better than the school district, then we need to get out of the education business. But I see, but I see that we can do better, you see. I see that we can do better. I, I see the re results that are happening. So um, I hope I answered your question. Let me take another question. Yes. The little rim there, yeah, not the ball, oh, but the rim. Okay. I'm fascinated by the um, work that you've done in Philadelphia in neighborhoods and economic development. Do you see that um, possibility in Milwaukee with Universal? Well, I think so. I think that's part of um, the whole Universal plan is to... Um, to take a community that that is um, desperately in need of development because you just can't have a community. A community has to be managed and it has to be maintained. You can't you can't just have a house and you don't paint the house or you got to fix the house up. You, you just can't. And from riding around, from what I've seen, is the beginnings and also uh, the deterioration of, of houses. And so um, that means that whomever is in these houses are not really um, taking care of the facilities. So we've done, I don't know, maybe about 2,000 houses in Philadelphia so far. And um, we're looking around here in Milwaukee, and I think that we could we could be responsible for um, for for that type of development in Milwaukee. Because once we started in Philadelphia, there's thousands of more people that said, "Oh, this is the thing to do." And uh, and so it helps out. It helps everybody out. It creates jobs. It creates jobs. It creates a much safer environment. Uh, you know. So um, yes, we we want to um, to do some development here. Let me take one more question here. Go up to the back. Yes. How are the students and teachers selected? For what is the criteria for selecting the students and teachers for your schools? Well, the students basically, um, I know in Philadelphia when we started out, there was like a lottery that we had uh, in Philadelphia. Here we've been trying to um, to get up to our quota, and I think we're, we're up at the quota now. Which is? Um, what is it, 400 students? 600, 600 and 650 was it? 650, 600, and we're we're almost there now. And um, they're basically students here in in the Milwaukee. Uh, th there's no criteria, in other words. We don't take one and don't take another. You know, we're, it's open to um, to all the students. I've been on the radio. I go on the radio and tell people, send your kids to to Universal. You know, so. Well, teachers is the same thing, yeah. And um, there is no other way. I mean, in, unless we're going to have like a private school or something, which is not a private school. They're charter schools that um, that have an opportunity to to uh, to come up with some new suggestions in the educational format. But you can't go too far away from. Uh, from the public school system. This is a non-instrumental MPS charter That's school. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, Sister Joelle. Is the universal plan uh, printed and published somewhere that we could access it? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I'm not sure. Is it on a website? Aspects of it is. Uh, no, we'll, we'll we'll get it to you. We'll get we'll get it to you. Okay, that's good that you asked me that. I like the way you said the universal plan. Is it available? 
because we've been telling people all along that uh, <clears throat> that you have to have a plan, and um, and we do have one. As a matter of fact, I'll give you this one when I leave. All right. Final question. you deal with that issue, if you would speak to that. But I'm also um, wondering about our parents. In Milwaukee, we have 85% of our children can't read on grade level, mm -hmm. and that has been a generational, um, I would argue, some generational challenges. Yes, so are you doing something specifically that includes parents in the work that you're doing with our children, yeah. to have like parent centers or a one-stop shop to be a resource? Mm -hmm. I know it to be true, so I'm a actually asking you to share it with the audience. Yes, thank you. Well, I think that you're 100% right. This is uh, what I've been saying all day long, that this is generational. This is not something that just happened. This has been over the last three, 400 years where you have parents who have not been uh, educated and they cannot reciprocate to their children. So um, we're just getting started. In Philadelphia, we have, um, we have a lot of programs for parents. And what we found out is that many of the parents don't want people to know that they can't read or write, you know, and uh, and, and and that's 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 not good, you know. It's like a person that can't hear and they act like they, they can hear, you know what I mean? Or so there's a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges that that have to be dealt with, uh, and we are setting up those um, programs to, uh, to encourage parents, to encourage uh, caretakers of, of the children to, uh, to re-educate themselves. And it's not going to be easy. Like I said, it's not going to happen overnight. My projection is it might take another 100 years, another 100 years in order to get it even on an even kill. And that's not a long time when you start to look at it, you know. But I see a lot of gray hair in here, so y'all, y'all halfway there. Uh, no, I'm, I'm 70 years old myself, so 100 years is not a long time, you know. So, you know, you wonder. You say, well, where did the time go? Where, where does time go? So you got to prepare the next generation, and the next generation, you, you got to be able to have that uh, succession. If you're a success, you're not a success unless you have succession. And then you're not a success unless your life is significant. You got, you have to. It has to be on that level. So, so I hope I answered your your question for you. I'm going to wrap things up there. Uh, a couple of uh, notes before we go. Uh, tomorrow is our final uh, on the issues event of the spring semester here at Marquette. Um, Senator Tammy Baldwin will be with us tomorrow, and then on May 15th we have an all-day conference here at the law school. Uh, it will look at some new research that's been done on our uh, growing political polarization in southeast Wisconsin, the impact of that on policy, the impact of that on voter engagement. Uh, again, that is on May 15th. You're all welcome uh, to attend that. Uh, having said that, I'd like to thank everybody for their attention today. I'd like to thank you for your interest in this topic. And most of all, I'd like to thank our guest, Kenneth Gamble, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Appreciate it.